uh, well, today uh, we're wrapping up our series on Moses, and I, I mean, this is perfect napping weather. Um, you got the rain going, a little drift of thunder, you're going to hear the dulcet tones of the preacher, you may fade in and out, which is okay, I'm going to give you permission for that today. Um, but we do have some stuff that we need to talk about as we wrap up this series, um, and as we begin to kind of move away from Moses and this story, at least for now. Um, one of the things that I did uh, over this past week, which I don't always do at the end of a series, is to kind of go back and review it. Um, this has been one of our longer series, this is our ninth week in the series, and, and I don't know about you, I do well to remember last week's sermon, and I wrote it and preached it. Um, uh, so I went back and I looked at the messages that have led us to this point, and I pulled um, some lessons out of them, some takeaways. And I did this primarily for my sake, uh, because I, 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 want to, I want to remember this journey, because I've, I've learned some things about my faith um, from the life of Moses that I don't want to leave behind. Um, so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to do two things. I'm going to offer you just a quick summary of what we've done from here. I'm going to share with you the lessons that I pulled from the messages in very brief form um, that I need to take with me, and, and maybe they'll feed you as well. Uh, and then we're going to wrap up the series by giving you one last lesson uh, from the life of Moses, one that is not only important for us, it's critically important for our children. Um, and for the generations that come after us. Um, so why don't we begin? Uh, when we started this series, uh, before we ever talked about Moses at all, we talked about the world into which Moses was born. And it was a world uh, that was run by a guy named Pharaoh, uh, the ruler of Egypt. And this was a person whose life was steeped in fear. And we talked about that this first week because fear in and of itself is not a bad thing. Fear can save your life. Um, it's okay to be afraid of things. It's given to us by God. Uh, but if our lives are founded on fear, if fear is the foundation and everything is built on fear, that can lead to some bad places. Pharaoh feared the Israelites. He feared them because they were foreign and they were different. Pharaoh was suffering from something that we call xenophobia which is fear of the stranger or the foreigner. And because he was so afraid that they were going to harm him and his people and his nation, even though they had shown no signs of doing that, he brutally oppressed them. What we talked about that Sunday was as Christians, and we learned this message throughout the New Testament, but the word itself comes from the Apostle Paul. Uh, we learned that first Sunday that there is an antidote to xenophobia, and the antidote is philoxenia. Philoxenia is the Greek word which means the love of stranger or foreigner. And this, this message is preached throughout the New Testament, but specifically comes from Paul. And this is the message that, that we took away from that first week, is that it's okay to have fear, but before fear always comes love. And we are called to love even those who are different or strange or, or apart from us. Um, the second week, we talked about some really impressive women who were a part of Moses' story. And, and, and those stories began with two midwives who actually embodied Philoxenia, the love of the stranger, because they took care of the Israelites. Two women named Shipra and Puah, who disobeyed Pharaoh's orders for the sake of others. We talked about Moses' mother, Jochebed, and her faith in putting her baby in the river um, so that he might have a chance to live. And we talked about Moses, or we talked about Pharaoh's daughter, who drew Moses. Moses out of the water and adopted him uh, as her son. And what we learned in that second message was that while God can and does act in powerful ways on earth, the primary way that God works in the world is through God's people. God is mysterious and powerful, and God does things certainly without the benefit of people. But the primary way that God works is through those who follow and worship God. We are the primary vehicle for God's work on earth. And so every day we are called to bring God's presence into this world through our words and our actions, the things we do and don't do, say and don't say. Um, God is working through us. In fact, in the Moses story, God says, I heard the cries of my people and I've come down to earth to release them from their bondage and slavery. And then God turns to Moses and said, so you go and make that happen. So even when God comes down and speaks to Moses, God is saying to Moses, I'm here so that you can go and work on my behalf. I think that message still rings true uh, for us today. Um, the, the third week, we talked about the plagues. 
those 10 um, events that took place that ultimately allowed the people of God to move from their, their slavery in Egypt um, towards uh, their freedom in the promised land. And we kind of unpack those plagues. And these are stories that many of us are familiar with even from our childhood, uh, but they come with a much richer and deeper meaning. But the plague that we, f- we spent the most time uh, on that day was the 10th and final one, uh, because it's, it's a difficult story. Uh, If you were here that day or if you're familiar with the ten plagues, you you know what happened. It was the final plague. They called it the Passover, um, and it was the one where the Spirit of God moved through the land and where there was blood on the doorpost, God's God's Spirit passed over those homes, but where that blood wasn't there, God's Spirit entered into the home and killed the firstborn child, uh, male and female, of all the Egyptians, even their livestock. And so we have to struggle a little bit with that story because the freedom of God's people came at a cost, a high cost. Innocent sons and daughters, children who died in order for the people of God to find their way toward freedom and and were forced in that story to ask the question, at what cost is it okay for the good guys and gals to be set free? It's a hard story and a difficult story. Um, But it's a story that's mirrored in the life of Jesus Christ. And in the life of Jesus Christ, in some ways, that story, as hard as it is, is redeemed because Jesus talks about how we are freed from our own slavery, um, but that slavery is one of sin. And so this is the lesson that we took away from that day. Our freedom from the slavery of sin comes from the willing sacrifice of our Savior who gave his life so that others would not have to die. It's almost as if God changed that that story of causing others to die so that we would gain life by offering God's own child. And then Jesus willingly stepping into that sacrifice and saying, this is my body broken, not somebody else's body broken. This is my bloodshed, not an innocent's bloodshed um, that, that isn't connected to this. This is an offering of life, not a taking of life. And these stories mirror each other, but I think in this second one, we find almost um, some corrective grace uh, in it. After they had escaped from Egypt, uh, the people of Israel were fleeing, and they were trying to get away. And and as they did so, uh, they found themselves in an impossible situation. Uh, They were trapped on the Red Sea. It was before them, and they couldn't get through it. And behind them was an advancing Egyptian army. Uh, The largest and most powerful army on earth at the time was right at their heels. And the people were afraid, and they were frightened, and they were scurrying around in their panic because they didn't know where to go. Um, And in the midst of their panic and all of their scurrying around, uh, God spoke to Moses, and Moses spoke to the people and said, I need you to be still. All this scurrying around is not going to save you. In fact, your salvation will only come through stillness. Can you imagine? you got nowhere to go and you're trapped. And yet God says the only way you're going to get through this is to just stand in place. And so the people took a breath and they settled in. And as they did... God again worked through Moses to provide an incredible miracle. And and as they stood there, the waters began to part and a way began to appear for them to find their way through that wasn't there before. And if they had been too busy scurrying around and moving here and there, that moment would have never happened and their path would have never been um, found. I think there's a message for that in us, um, in that for us. While standing still is hard, sometimes it's only through stillness that our path forward can be found. I know that sometimes I do not stand still well. And sometimes there are moments in life where we get caught up in the panic of it and we feel like we've got to move forward and we're constantly moving and constantly moving. Um, But sometimes the path forward can only be found when we step back from that and we take a breath and we settle into it just a moment so that maybe a path will reveal itself that wasn't there when we were so frantic. Um, Sometimes we need to pause and take a breath and, and remember that salvation can be found in stillness. Once the people had moved through that opening in the Red Sea and found themselves to the other side, we find what I think is one of the most beautiful parts of the Moses story. The waters have closed and the Egyptian army is no longer a threat. And and as they find themselves in true freedom for the first time, Moses, the the, the leader who has such a speech impediment, his brother Aaron speaks for him. Moses hardly speaks before the people at all because he can't get anything out of his mouth. But when they finally find freedom, Moses starts to sing. And as he sings, the entire nation joins with him in this beautiful chorus of gratitude and thanksgiving. And and after they finish singing, some women who were there grab some tambourines and they start to play them. 
and all the people dance. And they just dance this joyous celebratory dance of this journey that they've been through and the freedom that they found. It's one of the most exciting and joy-filled moments in the story of God's people. And that story um, reminds us that after you've been through a difficult journey and reached the other side, dance. It's okay. Even if you're not all the way to the promised land, every once in a while, it is a good idea to just dance and celebrate. Even if you don't dance, I don't dance. I'm not talking literal here. Find a way to dance, to enjoy life, to celebrate the journey and where you are. After they danced, they continued their journey through the wilderness. They found themselves in the, in, the, in the desert called Sinai. And while they were there, God gave them ten commandments. And we spent a couple weeks looking at those commandments. Because in those commandments, we find life. I know that the commandments are filled with a lot of thou shalt nots. And typically, people don't like to be told what they can't do. And we often rebel against that. Um, But in these commandments, we are given something that is meant to guide us and shape us. And the lesson that I take away from them is that the Ten Commandments were not meant to restrict life, but to make it more abundant. By helping us to see the things that we do that harm ourselves and harm others, God gives us us kind of some guardrails so that as we go through the journey of life, um, we can do so in a way that's more abundant and healthy and safe. Last week, um, we spent some time in what I think was probably the hardest story of the journey. Uh, We learned that after two years, the people of Israel came to the promised land. And they could have entered the promised land after only two years in the wilderness. But they lost faith. They didn't trust God. They were afraid that they would be destroyed by the people who were already living there. And they rebelled against God. And because they rebelled against God, God denied their entry into the promised land. And that's what caused them to go and wander around for 40 years in the wilderness. And the purpose of that was so all of the people who rebelled against God would die in the wilderness and not enter into the promised land. And it's such a harsh punishment for their lack of faith. There were only two exceptions, Joshua and Caleb, who exhibited faith and tried to encourage people to do the right thing. But even with that, the people rebelled and they turned away. And because of that, no promised land for them. And when we hear that story, our temptation is to jump to the grace of Christ and say, thankfully, we're a New Testament people, not an Old Testament people, because even when we fall short, the grace of Christ is going to see us through. But then we go and we read the New Testament, and and if we read it with open eyes and vulnerable hearts, we, we read that as Jesus is talking about us getting into the promised land of heaven, Jesus says there's some things that we have to do, and if we don't do them, we may fall outside the shadow of grace. And those are some of the toughest passages in the New Testament to read because we cling to the ones that promise life and give us hope. But what Jesus says quite clearly is that when we find ourselves like the Israelites did where we have a moment of choosing God's path or our own path and we willfully and knowingly choose our path instead of God's path, then we may find promised land denied. Don't get me wrong, the the, the grace is abundant and the grace is real, but the grace is when we try and fall short in those moments where we willfully turn away. Um, we're We're stepping into a path that may be damaging to ourselves. When we live as though we are entitled to grace, we both cheapen the gift it is and risk stepping outside of its shadow. Grace is a gift that is abundant and freely offered Um, But sometimes I think we live into it as though it's ours and we're entitled to it and no one's going to take it away from us no matter what we do. Um, And and Jesus has some caution about that. And the story that we find in Moses where the people were turned away from the promised land is a part of that caution. Well, today, um, and again, these are the primary stories that we've looked at over the last several weeks and and we've left some things out. But today we're going to kind of wrap up the journey. I want to give you one more lesson uh, from the life of uh, Moses. And again, I think it's an important lesson for us to hear. It's an important lesson, especially um, for our children as we think about future generations and their coming uh, into their own. After they had spent the 40 years in the wilderness and the time had come for them to pass into the promised land, uh, God pulls Moses aside and tells Moses that, the time, that his time on earth has come to an end. Scripture tells us he's 120 years old and his vision is still as clear as it ever was. And, and I struggle with that. <laughs> Um, at 120 years, he still sees perfectly. At 45, I can scarcely see a thing. Um, it also tells us 
that at 120, he had not lost any physical vitality. He was a strong man of mind, of body, and of sight, but he was not to enter the promised land. And so God tells him it's time to make preparations. And with that word, Moses does something that I find so beautiful. He gathers all the people of Israel, and there were 12 tribes, right, of the people of Israel. And he goes through and he speaks to each tribe, one at a time, and he offers them a blessing. And it's so beautiful. In this moment of blessing, we hear these words of Moses to each one of these tribes that makes it very clear that Moses knew them. Moses loved them. Moses recognized their strengths and their weaknesses. And as he was getting ready to to go to heaven uh, to die, he he turns to them and he says, I want to leave you with a final blessing. I want you to, to know what I see in you. And I want you to hear what I think God has in store for you. And it's just this beautiful moment as he walks through and shares this with his people. As I was reading through the blessings this week, I was reminded of a mentor uh, that I had um, long ago before I had children um, who said something to me that was very important. He said that um, we, as we age, we, we, we have a responsibility to those who are younger than us to bless them. That that in our culture, we've lost the importance of intentional blessing. And that the people who are younger than us and are behind us, they need that blessing. And they hunger for that blessing. And they thirst for that blessing. And when they don't get it, there's this kind of hole, this kind of vacuum for them. Not just as individuals, but but as, 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 as an entire generation. They need to be blessed. And I found such wisdom and value in that. It's not just about blessing our children. It's, a, it's about blessing our nieces and our nephews and our grandchildren. It's about blessing those that we coach and those that we teach and those that we walk alongside. It's about blessing those that we work with and that we worship with and, and, and that we serve with in the community and that we're part of um, each other's lives. We're called to bless those who come after us. Um, and, and I want to give you just, some, some, just, just a couple steps, a few steps about what that blessing can look like um, in our lives as we, as we try to offer it. Um, the first three come directly from Moses' example. The fourth one is one that's a little bit separate, but you'll understand why. The first thing is that as we bless others, the blessing's got to be sincere. Moses knew the people, and he blessed them with sincerity. He didn't just cover up their weaknesses. He talked about those weaknesses and how they could be overcome and how they could continue to be used um, to the glory of God. And he talked about their specific strengths. We are called to be specific and sincere in our blessings. Um, It's not that general blessings are a bad thing, but we've got to push past that. Uh, I've, I've, tried to, um, I've tried to bless my sons as I've raised them as their parent, and I have not always done this the best, um, and I often fall short of the goal that I had before I ever had children to bless them. But one of the things that I've done is to be very specific in my blessing for each one of them. The one thing that the blessing shares in common with the both of them is that they both know that they're loved. You ask them, and they will tell you that I tell them multiple times a day, sometimes wrapped up in a headlock. I love you. I will always love you. That will never change. They know that. That's the generic overall blessing that they know they have their father's love. But beyond that, the blessing that I try to offer them is specific. Our oldest son has the most compassionate heart towards other people, um, other than his brother, that you would see um, in, 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 you know, in, in the world, right? He, he's so compassionate towards other people and especially children. And so I've talked with him throughout his life and said, you've got such a gift for this. And I, I give him specific examples and moments when I see it. And I say, Ethan, no matter what you do in life, if you continue to do that, you're going to be blessed and you're going to be a blessing to the world. Graham has a compassionate heart. His compassion leans towards animals. He loves animals. And if you know him at all, you know that this kid loves birds as much as any person who has ever walked the planet loves birds. And I asked him one day, I said, why is it that you love birds so much? He said, he said Dad, the world needs them. We depend on them. And they can't speak for themselves. We have to be their voice. 
right? Say, so, Graham, that's beautiful. Regardless of what you do in life, be the voice for other people. Be the voice for creation and for animals. As long as you maintain that voice, you will be blessed and you will be a blessing. You find those things where it's real and it's sincere and you get specific about it. And this isn't to gloss over the struggles, the weaknesses. You know, I, I, I kind of joked around and said, my oldest son has the most compassionate heart in the world, except for when it comes to his brother. In those moments, which are perfectly reasonable because we all have siblings, we, when we have siblings, we know what this is like. Um, but on my best days, um, instead of grabbing him in a headlock and getting onto him, on my best days, I sit down with him and I just say, you know, that, doesn't, that action does not reflect the compassionate heart that I know that lives in you. It, it's outside of who God created you to be. And it's not helping the situation. Don't, don't live into that shadow side of you. Live into that, that blessed side of you, that positive side of you, that generous side of you. And, and that's a blessing when we talk about it in that way. When we bless our children, our students, our, our mentees, those who come after us, it's got to be sincere. And when it's sincere, I, I think they carry it with them in a powerful way. We got to remember that our blessings aren't about us. As Moses is giving the blessing to the Israelite people, he doesn't even talk about himself. He, 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 he's not even a part of the dialogue. He's only talking about them and what's going on in their life and what's happening in their life. The blessing is the passing on of the mantle, which is the third reminder that the blessing is about the future. The blessing is not about the past. It's not about what's already happened. It's for what's to come. And I think that this is where it gets hard for those of us who are on the other side and are extending blessing more than we're receiving it is because those things that we cherish, that we hold dear, that, that, have, that have carried us this far, they're very special and important to us. And sometimes we want nothing more than, than for the younger generations to value the things that we value in exactly the same way that we value them. Uh, my experience is that they don't value those things any less. They just approach those values differently. And just because it's different, it doesn't mean that it's wrong. When we give blessing, we're passing the mantle. We're saying that while you may not do it the same way we're doing it, we believe in you. And we know that you can make the world a better place. And we know that you can live in to the blessings that God has in store for you. Giving blessing isn't about maintaining what's blessed for us. It isn't about us at all. It's about them and their future. And we see that clearly in Moses' blessing for his people. The last thing that I'll say about that is we need to give blessings early and often. Um, most of us don't have the experience that Moses had where God calls us aside and says, hey, um, time's coming to a close. You might want to wrap it up. Um, so we need to do this early and often. We need to take every moment, every opportunity that we have to make sure that we're blessing those who would come after us. Before we move on from blessing, I want to say just a quick word about curse. I think cursing those who come behind us is something that feels pretty natural and pretty easy. Just ask a millennial. Um, go do a Google search. What's wrong with millennials? And man, you'll get a thousand hits immediately. Um, and what would have happened if you'd have been in my generation? you would have had the same experience. And you probably had the same experience regardless of what generation you're a part of. It is easy for us to pick on the generations that come after us. It's really easy to do. Um, but that kind of cursing, I think it limits not only their generation, but it limits our relationship to them, and I think it limits their potential. And it creates unnecessary tension. Um, again, we've all experienced that. We, all of our generations have been criticized by the generations that came before us, every one of us. And yeah, there may be some differences there, but I'm telling you, from the ones that I know who are coming up after us, there should be far more articles about how amazing they are and about what they're doing that's right than what they're doing that's wrong. I will always have hope in the future um, because of who they are. If we want to be a part of that, it's not through curse it's through blessing and encouragement and hope. After Moses gave his blessing, his encouragement, and his hope to the people of Israel, uh, God took him up on top of a mountain. And I don't know how God did this, but God showed Moses the entire promised land. He saw every piece of it from corner to corner. And after seeing the land where his people would go, um, Moses died. Moses died. 
But before he died, he was given this incredible gift where God basically said to him, your people are going to be okay. Isn't that, in, in a way, isn't that what we want? When our time on this earth comes and it's time for us to go, we just want to know that the people who come after us are going to be okay. That they're going to be all right. And God says, they're going to be in this promised land. It's going to be abundant. And I'm going to hold them in the palm of my hands. And Moses, you've done great work. Um, but now it's time for you to let go. But I want to let, I want to let you know that even though you got to let go, I'm not letting go. Moses, I've got them and they're going to be okay. And I think because of that gift, um, we can really trust that Moses rested in peace. After he died, it was 30 days of mourning, and after the 30 days of mourning were over, they appointed Joshua to lead the people into, into the promised land. Remember, Joshua was one of those um, two spies who remained faithful and didn't deny God and, and encouraged the people to follow God. Um, at the very, very end of the story of Moses, um, this is how Scripture wraps up that story. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants in his entire land, and for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all of Israel. Never since has there been a prophet like Moses. That's such a powerful thing to say, especially when you think about where his journey began. Remember the title of this series. It's in the footsteps of the reluctant prophet. When, Moses, when God called Moses to follow God and do all these amazing things that would make Moses the greatest prophet in the history of our faith, Moses' response was, no, not me, someone else. Please, please, please. Moses is perhaps the most reluctant leader our faith has ever known. And yet somehow he was able to push past that reluctance and take the steps that he needed to take to fulfill God's call in his life. I wonder what it would be like if we push past our own reluctance and followed God's call more faithfully in our own lives, maybe, just maybe, we might find ourselves closer to the promised land than we ever thought would be possible. My hope for us is that while we're leaving this series behind and while we're leaving this story behind, we'll take the lessons it gives us with us on the journey because there is still much journey to be taken. But when taken in faith, we will find ourselves blessed and we will find ourselves a blessing. Amen.